Hello and welcome to the Magical Learning Podcast for this week. This week we're talking to Jess Stewart about performance and sustainability of ourselves. It's an amazing conversation and it's it's a really important one to talk about how you can manage your energy. Have a great day and also a magical week. Hello everybody and welcome to the Magical Learning Podcast for this week. As you would have been able to tell by the title, we do have a guest on which is very exciting and we'll get to them shortly. But first, let's check in on the team and see how they're going and what they've been up to this week. So John, tell us a little bit about your week. Good to see you back as well. It's always good having you on. Oh, thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, g'day, everyone. G'day, listeners. Um, this week, oh, I've got no idea. I, I don't know where the week's gone, to be honest. It's just disappeared, <laughs> and suddenly we're at Friday, and uh, it's a weekend. So, got nothing. <laughs> Well, that's. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you time teleported, time travelled to this podcast right now, and that you've made it. So that's awesome, John. <laughs> Great to have you on, um, Al. Uh, I'll throw to you. How are you going this week? Uh, probably a bit of a, a contrast to John, where I've had time this week, and I thought I'd try something special for my family and went and printed out some photos. One of them was my wife Renee's face as in a full photo, which I cropped and I thought was very beautiful and got quite a surprise when I got home. Everybody agreed it was just too close up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good effort there, Al. I think it's the thought that counts on that one. Um... (laughs) I agree. Thanks, Jeff. I was trying. (laughs) Look, you you thought framing the face meant something a little bit different in this context. You know, you've literally gone out and put a face in a frame. Um, but I think that was a good effort. I did. Like, to me, it was a beautiful photo, but I guess guys sees things differently than girls, and girls, so that's just zoomed in way too much. <laughs> well, that's all right. It's, good. it's constructive criticism for next time, Al, you know, so... I'm learning. Yeah, that's it. Danette, how are you going this week? Yeah, good, Jess. Um, we actually had a sunny day yesterday, so it was awesome. It was outside, and I'm in the final stages of my book. So the book is due to the editor on Monday. So I've been doing quite a lot of writing in between workshops this week, but it's awesome. Very excited. Uh, that's a great effort. Very exciting. And we'll give people, that's a little teaser um, for people that are listening. We'll give more info on that book later, but uh, ex- exciting to know that's in the works. Um, and we've got uh, a ring wraith, Graham Gerstenberg there. Um, <laughs> what's, <laughs> how are you going this week, Graham? Um, quite clearly, Ches, I am the emperor um, rather than the ring wraith. Maybe I'm not. Luke, I am not your father. Well, I'm good. Thank you. Um, sorry I'm a little bit late, folks, but, uh, you know, I'm here. I'm cold. Such a sook. But it's Friday, and there was sun in the universe somewhere yesterday. By the way, everybody, Danette's book is absolutely amazing. Um, The working title is How to Live with Graham and Still Be Happy. And it's also amazing simply because I haven't contributed to it, to buy it whenever it's ready. A glowing and strange review there from Graham. Um, (laughs) It's Friday. (laughs) Um, amazing and thanks for jumping on for uh, we weren't sure if Graham was going to jump on but he jumped on at the perfect time while we're introducing people so that's a thumbs up there great work Graham Um, and Jess uh, how are you going this week I am going pretty good thanks Jess I am recovering from COVID so I've been better but as the week goes on I feel less tired and more healthy so that's a good thing right (laughs) That's definitely a good thing, and we're so happy to have you on. It's really exciting to uh, chat to you today. Um, well, I think something that is definitely going to make your job easier, I am going to read out a little bit about something for people that may be being introduced to you for the first time, so people can get to know you a little bit. Um, so let me jump into that. So Jess Stewart, uh, first of all, great person, uh, author, coach, speaker, uh, an international speaker, coach, and author of six personal development books specializing in mindset, performance, and leadership with a background in senior human resources roles and a decade working in leadership development. A brush with burnout in a corporate career led Jess across the world to train with Buddhist monks and nuns. A decade later, after coming out, writing six books and running her own successful business, she shares what she knows about peak performance, leading with confidence, 
being a sustainable resource and achieving our potential to have influence and impact. What an amazing person to talk to because that is something that I think affects a lot of people. So Jess, thank you so much for being on the ML podcast. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. Now, Jess, before we get into uh, some of the questions that the team's got for you, you, with all that background, you, the topic that you gave us was performance and sustainability of ourselves, which I think is really important, especially after, um, especially after COVID. You've very directly experienced that recently, but um, but it, in a very broad sense, uh, I think a lot of people are sort of talking about this. So, tell us a little bit about why you chose this topic. Yeah, and I think you nailed it there, Jess, um, that so often these these two things can be talked about like they're separate. <laughs> you know, we're either sustainable or we're performing at our peak. So my passion has always been how do we join both of those things together, particularly off my background, you know, working in HR, working with leaders, you see when it's done well and you see when it's not done well and the impacts and consequences of that. And particularly now in our current climate, post-pandemic, with all of the economic uncertainty that we have and the, just the generic future uncertainty I think never has this been more of um, a, a sort of topical thing to, to chat about a hundred percent and I think you know it's a it's a yeah once I say again great topic I actually think today I wanted to start with Al's question because Al I think that this is a good a good sort of uh, place to start so Al what was your question and why did you choose it yeah, Jess, my question is, that how do we know when we're getting close to burnout? And I'm not sure if this is related to me. It's I'm thinking from that idea of perfectionism, always striving to be the best, and then one day just giving up you know, because that perfection is not achievable. Yeah, that's a great question, Al. And you're so right. If we are striving for perfection, we kind of, within that, set ourselves up to fail because it's never achievable. So then we end up failing right um and burnout is something that we talk about so much these days and we see from the statistics globally that it is inc it's increased over the last few years and it's hit its peak at the same time that we had the pandemic probably not surprisingly right and i think it's one of those things that can be hard to spot particularly in ourselves it's often harder to spot in ourselves than it is to see in others because it isn't like the flicking of a switch we don't wake up one day and go oh i'm burned out it's more of a slow burn so, you know, it starts at that stuff that most of us experience. So the overwhelm, being too busy to take breaks, loss of focus, feeling tired all the time. And then it starts to creep up. And as it creeps up, we start to notice an impact on our performance, which can lead to a lot of frustration, guilt, resentment. We start to see some of the responses to that, maybe anxiety. And then it starts to get to the point again. So I've got the five stages of burnout in, in the book and at the top end, seeing it result in physical illness, also seeing a detachment. So we start to enjoy people that we enjoy. We have a kind of exhaustion that sleep doesn't fix, even though we may sleep more than we ever have. We tend to lose some of our good habits and start some maybe um, bad habits bad habits, shall we say, in a bid to cope with what's going on. And there's this general sense of withdrawal and of hopelessness when we think about the future and just a loss of motivation for everything. And I know for me, when I went through burnout, it was, I couldn't, I lived by the beach in New Zealand and I couldn't even motivate myself to go for a walk on the beach, even though it was my favorite thing to do. And I knew that it would help. I just couldn't, there was nothing there. And for me, it became a glass of wine on a Friday night to relax was a bottle and it wasn't just a Friday. And all of these things I could say in hindsight, yep, that was me burning out. But at the time it was explainable. I had a busy week. This is self-care. I need to rest. I can't be bothered to go for a walk on the beach. So it's when you look back at a lot of this stuff, it seems obvious, but they're the sort of warning signs really around burnout for ourselves and of course others as well. Thanks for that, Jess. I can really relate to a lot of what you've mentioned there. Yeah, I look forward to the rest of this conversation and seeing what, I guess, the antidote to all that is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Al, for that question. Great one. Um, I might throw to John now. John, what was your question and tell us a bit about why you chose it? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Jess. Um, hey, Jess, I guess you. you've moved from the corporate world into running your own business and and you know, and I look at Graham and Danette who, who have run their own business for a lot of years, you know, and it's a lot of last minute.com that, that occurs in certain times. You're trying to do 
you know, try and get things perfect, as Al was talking about, and get things right um, and deliver on your business to make sure that you're at the top of the game. But how do you balance that with that with life um, and not being totally overworked and, and killing yourself in the process, I guess? How, where's that balance and how do you maintain that mental health apart from the bottle of wine? <laughs> yeah, so true, John. And one of the hardest things for us in business, right? Because I, you know, particularly transitioning out of a nine to five job where you have one job, you go mm. into a business and you're everything. And normally when you start up, it's just you. So you become every single person, you know, your accounts team, your marketing team, your IT, everything is you. And so we end up spreading ourselves so thin as a result. And for me, it was this distinction that I talk about in the book between quality and quantity. I think many of us have been conditioned over this quantity approach. The more hours we work, the more we'll achieve and the better performance we'll get as a result. And yet, particularly when we're in our own business, we have to think very carefully about the kind of things we spend our time on. Otherwise, we would fill 24 hours a day every day mm. with stuff. But is it the right stuff? And this, quant uh, this quality approach has led me to the point where the stuff that I'm doing is the important stuff. I get less distracted by the busyness and the noise. Um, delegation was one of the tools I had to learn very quickly when I started my own business because you mm. simply can't do it all and nor do we have the skills to do it all. So for me, rather than hours worked now in my business, it's the value and impact that I add. So there are certain things I do in my business that I would never have done in my corporate career. And that might be because I'm now my own boss, of course, as well. But I'll create space in my schedule where it looks to everybody else from the outside like I'm not actually working. I might be walking in the bush or surfing or on the kayak, but it's those times where I have my best ideas or solve a problem that I've been mulling around for weeks or make a decision that seems so much more accurate and clear than it would have done had I been in the office amongst emails and back-to-back -back meetings. So I think for me, it's this uh, quality over quantity and the creation of space that is so important for us adding value and impact. And it's so easy for us to get distracted by the noise in our business and end up doing far too many things and missing out then on the stuff that actually adds the value and impact. Does that also include sort of having a knockoff time? Because, I mean, nine to five, you work till five o'clock and then you go home. And, but in your own business, you don't have yeah. that. Yeah, and it's, I think it's about what works for you. And I think one of the beautiful things about running our own business is that we get to decide. We're our own boss. So sometimes, um, like this week's a great example, my wife's away. So I'm actually working in the evenings, which I don't normally do when she's around because she doesn't let me. Um, however, <laughs> what that means is because I'm not a big TV watcher. So when I'm by myself, I love to work in the evenings. But what that means is, so today I've been for a massage at 10 a.m. Yeah. And when there's waves, I go for a surf at 11. And so my day looks different. And I'm doing the things in the day in sort of, you know, during nine to five that maybe aren't work. And then I'm yeah. working in the evenings because it works for me. And I think yeah. that's that flexibility that if we allow ourselves can just play to our strengths and, and our lifestyles as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, I like that, that flexibility and playing for your strengths quite a lot. Beauty. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for that, John. And thanks, Jess. Um, it, it actually touches on a little bit of a, the podcast we we're doing last week was talking a little bit about flow and you talking about getting out on the waves and stuff is also sort of like, we, I, it's such an important point that um, I think I'm hearing you talk about, I heard about it last week. I think it's something I definitely have to implement a bit more in my life using that time to kind of uh, give yourself space to have great ideas. So yeah, thanks for that, Jess. Love that. Um, Graham, I might go to you now. What was your question? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Jess. Hi, Jess. Hey, Graham. Great to meet you. Um, <laughs> I was going to say I completely sort of related to your comment um, a couple of minutes ago about wanting to be able to do something like stay up late but can't because, you know, relationships are a fun thing. I would uh, much prefer to be over at the other side of the road in the paddock um, driving a bobcat and just digging holes but my wife won't let me <laughs> I had an interesting conversation with one of my coaching clients this morning about the difference between living to work and working to live um and i, I don't know it's not necessarily whether one is better than the other or one's right and one's wrong but it's just two slightly different sort of takes on on that relationship between our lives and our work and 
so I was curious about this idea of um, performance and sustainability or sustainable performance. Actually, just before I ask you my other question, uh, I have a new question for you. Do you consult to um, work with sporting clubs at all? Or would you consider? Uh, there's something... a particular football team on this side of the ditch that are absolutely atrocious and they seriously need some help. <laughs> I don't know whether um, I could help them and sporting performance, but, yeah, certainly I work yeah, with athletes. <laughs> something's got to give. So in in yeah, trying to find this um, this idea of, of life-work balance or life-work integration, which is um, another conversation we had earlier, my, my question was around um, trying to find that balance between self-care, like practicing self-care, because we know that that's the thing that sustains us just in, in terms of yeah, resilience, adaptability, positivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so trying to find a balance between that and wanting to perform at, at your peak. And, and I think the phrase I had in my original question is, how do you find a balance between making sure that we look after ourselves and this um, just crush it attitude with all due respect to Gary Vaynerchuk, who... Um, you know, made a name for himself by doing just that, working longer than and harder than anybody else on planet Earth, but also realising at some point that that wasn't sustainable. So um, that was probably the worst question in the history of questions. <laughs> so maybe I'll just, you can delete all of this in post, Jess. What tips do you have um, for helping people find a balance between that self-care and wanting to just crush it. Yeah, and that's a tough one, right? Because we've been taught yeah. that the just crush it and just push through, she'll be all right, get over it, keep going, is the way through. And that's the old model, I guess, of peak performance. But what we're seeing is that that's also what's led us to a lot of burnout. And mm. so this sustainable approach, and for me, when I talk about work-life balance, I mean, I don't think there is such a thing. I think that implies that work and life are two different things and that life starts when work stops, whereas I see it all as one and work is part of life. So it sits in there, which is why this sustainability piece is so important. And I often liken it to a road trip. You know, we when we're in our car on a road trip and the fuel light comes on, we would never dream of going past a fuel station, particularly not in rural Australia, because you never know when the next one's going to be. And so we stop and we refuel the car, even though it adds minutes onto our journey and takes longer. We know it means we're going to get there. And if we don't, we're going to end up broken down on the side of the road. And so it's applying that analogy to ourselves for sustainable performance. Self-care stuff, whilst we might see it as, oh, you know, it's a bit of an indulgence, it's a luxury, it's a nice to have, it can wait until the important work is done. That's our equivalent of pulling over to the fuel station. And if we don't do that, we end up broken down on the side of the road. So in order to get to our destination, we need those times to refuel. Um, and that's where the self-care comes in to, to invest in that. And that keeps us sustainable. So it means our metaphorical vehicle performs better and we get to yeah. our destination. Yeah, nice. Which also sort of implies that self-awareness is so important. 100%. Yeah. yeah, you because our cars have got a fuel light on, we don't. We have to know when our inner fuel light is coming on and what the trigger points are so that we know we need to refuel. We don't get um, an indicator like our, our cars give us. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Jess, that was a beautifully put point, and I think I've uh, found my social media snip out, cut out bit. That's just perfect. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, great lesson there. Um, I might actually, I think, it, and it leads perfectly into Kanika's question. So I might ask Kanika's question, which was, how do we balance our workload and sustain ourselves at work so that we can be more present for our lives outside of work? Yeah, this is a hard question to answer. Yeah, you know, with with just one answer because it's all it's different for so many of us. I don't think there's a blueprint that I can say if you do these five things, then you'll get balance because it means different things to different people. So I think it's less about what we do and more about when and how we make time for it. So for me, it's surfing, it's yoga, it's being in nature, it's walking my dog, um, anything that you know, obviously we've got a social element because we're human beings and social creatures, anything that helps us uh, learn or be creative 
all of those things are our equivalent of refueling the tank. Um, I know for me, meditation has been key in managing my overwhelm and stress levels, but also gaining more focus and concentration in my brain and um, a lot less overwhelm in the process. So, I mean, they're some of the things that I do, uh, but I always say to people, you know, pick what works for you. You know what you need to recharge. You know the things that make you feel good. So the question then is, when do you get time for doing that? And that's where this space piece comes back into the conversation, I think, because as much as it's great to have space in our schedule, we also need space in our brain sometimes and time away from the busyness and the doing to kind of just gather our thoughts and get perspective and have a rest. So where does that happen for us? Yeah, such a good point. Again, I yeah, I definitely feel like it's something that I'm trying to also work on a little bit with is trying to get that, free up that time specifically to do stuff where you can just kind of, I guess, do what feels more like feeds your soul a little bit and gives you that energy. So um, yeah, thanks for definitely. that, Jess. Yeah, um, I might go to this one because I think you've touched on a little bit. I'll go to my question and then I think Danette's question is a perfect one to end on because I'm sure there's some uh, great advice there. But um, the... My question was about, and you touched on it a little bit before, when it comes to performance and sustainability, is it reasonable to expect that you're going to be able to offer high performance all the time? And if not, what's the best way to manage expectations for yourself and your team? And I just picked that because like you were talking about before, we talk about peak performance and we talk about sustainability. I often did think of those two things as two different things, but I I, I know that you've done a lot of work around this. So I wanted to yeah, hear how, how you can kind of balance those and how you can set expectations for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I love this question, Jez. This is my favorite question. Um, because I think, um, and when I was writing Burnout to Brilliance, I had this epiphany where, um, and this is certainly true for me and so many of the people I work with, because we're capable of brilliance, all of us on our given day, even our football teams on their given day, because we're capable of brilliance, we tend to expect it all the time. And that isn't practical. So we are not going to be brilliant every day. So in terms of managing our expectations, we need to know where we're at so that we know what we need, but also ourselves. So we will go through this um, kind of, you know, performance scale when I, and I often talk about this in my workshops, like um, the battery on our mobile phone, you know, you've always got a number on your mobile phone that tells you whether it needs charging soon or not. And for me, if I've got 20% or less in my battery, and I'm expecting 100% performance of myself, then it's not going to happen. And yet when I've been recharged, then totally, yes, I can expect brilliance of myself because I'm closer to 100%. And I often use this tool um, uh, of an energy audit, which you can do anytime, anywhere. And it is like checking in with yourself and going, right, if I had an internal battery right now, what number would it have on it? Am I at 20%? Am I at 80%? And when we know where we're at, we then know what we need. So that helps us then go, right, I need to recharge. What do I need to do to, to give myself more energy to recharge my battery? But then it also allows us to know what to expect of ourselves because we know where we're at energy wise. And it's like our bank accounts, I guess, you know, when there's only $10 in the account, we can't go and spend 50 on something. <laughs> so the same with our energy and, and then obviously how we perform as a result. That is so good. Sorry, I was just writing down some notes because I think just being able to check in on your energy and then allow yourself to give yourself the expectation based off of that is a great way to look at it. Um, I hadn't thought of that. So I think that's definitely something I'm going to try and do. And this energy audit sounds like something I think I would love to know a bit more about how to do um, and stuff. Uh, so that's great. Thanks thanks for that, Jess. Uh, I'm going to throw to Danette because, Danette, I think you have a great question. Uh, that was sort of a little bit different. And so, yeah, go for it. Nice. Because um, I, I looked and, and Jess also has a bit on Zen, a book on Zen. And also, yeah, I love that when you burnt out, you took yourself away and, and practiced with, with the Buddhists. So I really love that. So my question is, what helps a leader to be more Zen or become more Zen? And also, how does this help them and others? Um, yeah, I just think it was such a brilliant strategy and clearly you, you apply it. So, yeah, over to you, Jess. Yeah. Thank you. And it was for me, it was going from one extreme to the other. I had a career based on our Western model of people psychology in my HR space. 
And then as I was recovering from burnout and spend a lot of time in ashrams and various places, I had this interest in this ancient Eastern culture that I'd never come across before. So I, when I was researching for my first book, I spent time traveling across the globe, learning from people in this culture and spending a lot of time with Buddhist monks and nuns. And they always look so calm and peaceful. And I was like, I want that for myself. But how do we get that in our modern world, particularly as leaders, right? Because I think it's easy to go, well, if, if I lived on a hilltop in a monastery, I would be quite then because I've got no problems to, to worry about. So then my passion became, well, how do we weave that stuff into our Western model and, our, and what we know of people's psychology to, um, to then help leaders? And, and Leader Zen was the result of that. And I think for where we find ourselves now, particularly how the world has changed for people who lead, it is very different, even just in the last decade. Our multi-generational workforces, AI, the pandemic and um, hybrid working, lack of engagement, increased fatigue, all of the things that we see amid all the change and uncertainty that we exist in, I think it's become harder, harder for leaders to lead and harder to motivate others as a result. So this concept of Leader Zen is about self-mastery and deep knowledge of self that enables us to stay calm amid the chaos. And it's often referred to as vertical growth. So horizontal growth is kind of technical stuff that we've been teaching leaders for years. So how to write good reports, how to communicate, how to give presentations, all of that stuff. Horizo um, vertical growth is the deep understanding of self and this continuous development. And I think that's the bit that's potentially been underinvested, and that's the bit that makes us zen. And it's the analogy that I that I came across that I love is, is like the plastic cups that we use to put water in at our water coolers. Horizontal growth is putting more content in the cup. Vertical growth is growing the size of the cup. So if we can increase the size of our cup, develop self-mastery, master some of the skills like equanimity that enable us to stay calm amid the chaos, we're in a much better position to then lead inspire and motivate others and of course navigate the landscape that we find ourselves in as leaders in this current climate what a great answer and i love that cup analogy that was fabulous thanks jess awesome jess well this has been such a great chat i feel like i've taken away so much like i there's so many things that i've been thinking about um and so many great metaphors you've given batteries fuel stop that fuel stop one i also feel like really made a lot of sense so uh, i love that but before we go i definitely want to grab some final thoughts from people because um there was a lot to take out of this one so i might start with you al any final thoughts on performance and sustainability of ourselves or today's conversation yes yeah, similar to what you just said jess i love that idea of stopping for fuel and having that awareness like Graham mentioned around now, what is my fuel like? And my big takeaway, Jess, is that going surfing at 11 o'clock during the day is not a luxury. That's filling our tank. <laughs> Definitely, especially if that's the only time there's waves, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love it. Exactly right. Um, great takeaway, Al. Um, John, I'll go to you. Any final thoughts on performance and sustainability of ourselves and today's conversation? Yeah, no, thanks, Jess. The takeaway for me is looking at that work-life balance and that they're not two distinct things. And I guess with industrialization and the eight-hour workday, the advertisement was always eight hours of work, eight hours of um, family time or self-time, eight hours of sleep. So, you know, you break it up into chunks. But the whole lot's life. Um, yeah, and it's just that simple reminder that they're not distinct things. They're, that's life. So if you're not doing life well, you need to rethink that. And yeah, part of the energy order and understanding yourself is all part of that. So thank you. Love it. Yeah, thanks. And um, that, that was awesome, John. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Graham, I'll go to you. Uh, any final thoughts on today's conversation or performance and sustainability of ourselves? So many thoughts. Um... Uh, some great, um, great metaphors in there, Jess. And thank you. It's been a, a fantastic conversation to engage in. Um, love the idea of getting a bigger cup. I'm just wondering how to translate that into uh, increasing the size of our, our right on mowers so that it actually is a bobcat. But I'll have a chat with somebody else outside of this. Um, the thing that sort of sticks out most for me in all of this is the 
sustainability piece, um, you're noticing that the, the low fuel light has come on or noticing that your battery, your internal battery level has, has dropped, um, still comes back to our personal responsibility to ourselves to make sure that we are doing that. The self-care recharging your battery thing. But thank you. It's been a great chat. Yeah. Awesome, and thank you for that, Graham. Um, hopefully, Bobcat incoming soon. Love to hear the updates on that one. Rob's not. The, Rob's the, not. The, the dragons, however. Yeah. Uh, the dragons, no, they did. It's they're... not going to happen. No. This year, not this year. Um, <laughs> Danette, any final thoughts on today's conversation and performance and sustainability of ourselves? Well, I loved all of the discussion, and Jess, it's such an important discussion. I really like that concept um, for leaders to, to go into that vertical growth rather than the horizontal because the horizontal is often easier than actually getting into that uncomfortable space about is this working for me, who am I, what's going on, and yet the ripple effect of that is massive when we're able to do that. So love this conversation. I'm pretty sure we're going to be asking you back to have some more conversations. <laughs> um, and can I say, given you've had COVID this week, You've done an extraordinary job to show up and actually demonstrate exactly what it's like. And I hope you get the rest of the day off to, to rest. So thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Always happy to come back and chat. And yeah, I guess I have to practice what I preach, right? So having a massage this morning and only one more meeting today before I wrap up certainly helps with the COVID recovery. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea, Jess. And I just have to echo kind of what Danette was talking about, where it's, you know, it and, and everything that you've said kind of to me is all one sort of big idea, which is about understanding yourself better. And as you do that, you're able to better register where your low energy is at, give yourself better expectations and then kind of work from there. And then, you know, rebuild that if you can, uh, if you can, when you get the time to do that. So, um, yeah, so I think so much to take away from that. Uh, I'll definitely have to just after this, just sit down and just think about it so that it all registers properly in my brain. Uh, so thanks for that, Jess. Now, um, just before we go, any final thoughts that you have on today's conversation? and performance and sustainability of ourselves oh look it's been an absolute pleasure I don't think I've ever been on a podcast with multiple people and it's so nice it's so nice having lots of different conversations with different people so I've really enjoyed so the chat. many weird people Jess it's okay <laughs> to say that <laughs> and that's what keeps life interesting right um but I think yeah I, I, the, the thing that I'm constantly coming back to with with these conversations is that the thing that we've been taught busier we are the more we'll achieve is actually our undoing that's the stuff that takes us further away from peak performance rather than getting closer to the goal and I think that's the thing for me we have this we've glorified busy we're attached to it we often have it as a marker of our self-worth and how good we are in business or as an employee and that can so often be our undoing because the busier we are the chances are the less effective we are because cognitive, cognitively we're not functioning at our peak so I think when we start to unattach to busy or examining our relationship with the word, then I think that frees us up to be able to invest in being sustainable without the feelings of guilt and to do more of the things that make us perform at our peak without worrying that we're wasting time. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. Now, Jess, if, uh, if people have been listening to this and they go, I would love to reach out to Jess, uh, where's the best places for them to get in contact with you? So you'll find me on LinkedIn um, and I've got a heap of free resources on the website. So jessstuart.co.nz is the best place to go um, if you're interested in learning more. Great. Uh, well, those links will be in the bio. So if you're listening to this, just click on them. They're right there. Uh, to all the regular team, thank you so much for being on this podcast. What a great episode. And to Jess, thank you so much for making the time. Enjoy the rest of, once you've done that meeting, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, to everybody listening at home, have a magical week.